Today I want to give you a sense of the landscape of the discussion at the end of the Victorian era, and I hope that in doing so I'll draw a few threads together so that you can see how all of this looked from various points of view at the end of the period we're describing. Almost all of the skeptics of the 19th century fought against special divine action with borrowed weapons, and the most notable of those were the weapons borrowed from Spinoza and Hume, who forged them. It's very important for us to note that Hume's critique, first published in 1748, had very little influence in its own time in terms of positively influencing skepticism. It was not particularly original. Hume gave an articulate statement of some old objections, particularly in part two, but it became the rallying point for skepticism only very late, and you'll see why I think as you think over the trajectory of arguments against special divine action through the period. The appeal to the unity of nature in Powell and others is not borrowed directly from Hume. It seems rather to function as a presupposition of the scientific zeitgeist. And by scientific here, I don't mean to refer only to the physical or the natural sciences. History was viewed as a scientific endeavor by many of its practitioners, certainly Abraham Kuhnin whose critical method essay I posted up in the group for you to read, maintains that we are bound by a principle of analogy, and that is not the last time that we're going to see someone invoking that phraseology. In a very broad picture, the new theory of the age of the Earth and the origin and development of life due to Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin lent some support to the idea that everything in nature happens in a gradual manner driven by blind forces of the same kind we see operating at the present, so a principle of analogy. I do not wish to suggest that this was the foundation for an inference to uniformitarianism in the study of religion. However, I do think that it helped to shape the zeitgeist. This principle requires uh, from the standpoint of those who line up behind it, really only a philosophical defense of a very general kind. It is commended to us, as Kuhnin says, by its simplicity. When we apply it to religious studies, it brings all religions to the same level, subjects them to literary, historical, and anthropological investigation, but it precludes us from taking their supernatural claims seriously. Any of them, all of them. The principal point of attack, and therefore the point defended by the orthodox writers, is the credibility of the scriptural narratives. During the 19th century, you see some vigorous defense, both of the Old Testament narratives and of the New. But there was also a move in some circles to make a distinction between those. So Norton and Palfrey and Charles Gore made large concessions regarding the Old Testament. They accepted the Graf Wellhausen developmental hypothesis, some of Colenso's criticisms for the later writers like Gore, but they were scandalized by the attacks on the Gospels. It's worth noting that their opponents generally set the evidential bar quite high for historical narratives, and they justified that because of the inclusion of miracles in the narratives. So high, in fact, that no historical evidence could even possibly make the reported miracles credible. Generally, they refrain from saying miracles are impossible, but like Kuhnin, broadly conceded their possibility and then took away with the left hand what they seemed to concede with the right by saying that the odds against them were infinitely great and therefore no amount of evidence could make them justified. But you remember that a similar move that Hume made in part one of his famous essay did not prevent him from going on to attack the evidence in particular. And so, in this respect, following Hume's example, many of the writers later in the 19th century did attack specifics of the gospel narratives. And that brings me to one of the more colorful characters from the late Victorian era, Thomas Henry Huxley, an eminent British biologist, probably the greatest comparative anatomist of his time, uh, became famous for defending Darwin's theory of common descent. There was a, uh, 
remarkable debate that happened in 1860 between Huxley and Samuel Wilberforce, in which Wilberforce invited Huxley to tell the audience whether he was descended from monkeys on his mother's or his father's side, and Huxley issued a blistering rebuke that won him the debate, at least in the eyes of the audience. Huxley was not an atheist. He coined the term agnosticism to describe his own religious beliefs, and agnosticism in Huxley's hands was not merely a personal confession of his inability to determine on the basis of the evidence available to him, but also pretty broadly a criticism of anyone who pretended to have knowledge on either side of the issue of the existence of God, uh, a position that we still find ably uh, advanced today by people like Graham Oppie, who, for example, when asked whether God exists, just throws up his hands and says, who knows? It's very interesting to note that in one of his late books, Science and the Christian Tradition, published in 1896, Huxley takes the trouble to translate several paragraphs from one of Strauss's final works, The Old Faith and the New, and commends them to his readers as weighty words for them to, and here he invokes the language of the Book of Common Prayer, to read, mark, and inwardly digest. Uh, he describes the work of Strauss as uh, one of the protagonists of the New Reformation. He offers us the negative and the positive results of the rigorous application of scientific method to the investigation of the higher problems of human life. So note here that Huxley is professing admiration for and demonstrating indebtedness to the thought of Strauss. It's very interesting, though. Huxley is ambivalent about Hume. He does agree that those who want us to put our faith in the actual occurrence of interruptions of the natural order may be reasonably requested to produce evidence in favor of their view not only equal but superior in weight to that which leads us to adopt ours. If you recall Hume's essay of miracles, this language echoes Hume's language in the first part where he says that only when it would be a greater miracle for the testimony to be false than for the event to have occurred may we pre pretend to command his assent. On the other hand, Huxley thinks Hume's definition of a miracle is just wrong. It is, as he says, an employment of language which on the face of the matter cannot be justified. And he thinks that Hume overstates the case. Hume says it's more than probable that all men must die, that lead of itself cannot remain suspended in the air, that fire consumes wood and is extinguished by water. But Huxley says that's just not true. That language of Hume is an overstatement. Not one of these events is more than probable. Everything in history, everything even in science, is merely probable, perhaps greatly probable, but never absolutely certain, never certainly false. In this way, Huxley wanted to have a thoroughgoing kind of empiricism founded on the doctrine of the balancing of probabilities and found Hume's language too loose for his own taste. Huxley was a fine writer, one of those rhetoricians whose ability is employed to the full. He's not a blistering rhetorician in the manner of Voltaire. He's more genteel, perhaps a bit more in the manner of Gibbon, but he's not above tweaking his opponents when he thinks he's caught them in a blunder. There's a very famous engagement between him and Gladstone, published in the 19th century, which was a journal of the time in the year 1890, over the story of the Gadarene swine found in the Gospels. All three synoptic Gospels contain accounts of this. Huxley fastens on the location of Gadara. He says, we know where this was. It lies at a considerable distance from the Sea of Galilee, and the pigs would have had to run some six or seven miles in order to plunge down the steep place into the sea, which he thinks is sufficiently silly to call for a certain amount of levity. And he actually says, I venture to point out that training in the use of the weapons of precision of science may have its value in historical studies, if only in preventing the occurrence of droll blunders in geography. <laughs>
it was very difficult for anyone to get the better of Huxley rhetorically. But it is a curious point that while he was engaging in battles in the pages of the 19th century, William Sanday, a New Testament scholar, was making a careful study of the geography of Palestine. In his book, Sacred Sites of the Gospels, published in 1903, Sanday points out that from a textual perspective, the best text of Mark 5 doesn't have Gadarenes, but rather Gerasenes. And several text families concur in this. Similarly, in Luke chapter 8, this seems to be the best reading. And if you'll note the map at the right-hand side, the small body of water just about in the center of the landmass is the Sea of Galilee. And to the right of it, there's a place marked as Kursi. That's its modern name. But Kersa or Gersa, the two are equivalent in Aramaic, would have been the name of this place uh, in old times. Down further south of the sea, you can see the city of Gadara, and that's the place uh, that gives Huxley so much fun in talking about the swine running up to drop into the sea. Moreover, if we look at modern-day Kersi, we can see that there's actually a steep hillside running directly down into the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it is now fairly widely acknowledged that this is the proper reading of the text, and this is the probable location for the setting of that particular story. Uh, Huxley's remarks about droll blunders in geography may come back to haunt him a bit here. There are a couple of figures who pick up on language made popular by Canaan, both in the religion of Israel, Prophets and Prophecy, and in his essay from 1880 that I commended to you on critical method. Bradley was an idealist philosopher most concerned with questions of epistemology, but quite early in his career, he printed a little book called The Presuppositions of Critical History. And in that work, he argues that we cannot admit the supernatural in historical investigation. If we do, we will not be able to expect the future to resemble the past. That presupposition is fundamental to historical work. Once we lose it, we can no longer reason historically. Now, that claim invites a very natural objection. Are you not taking a, an empirical matter, a matter of fact, and prejudging that matter of fact? And Bradley frankly admits that he is prejudging it, but he says, the historian is not and cannot be merely receptive or barely reproductive. It is true that he may not actually add any new material of his own, and yet his action, insofar as he realizes that which never as such has been given him, implies a preconception, and he notes, in a sense, a foregone conclusion. So the foregone conclusion, the straightening of the crooked rests on a knowledge of the straight, and the exercise of criticism requires a canon. Canon here meaning a measuring rod. We have to measure the past by the present. We have to assume the uniformity of the causes of the kind that we now see operating around us. Thus, the historian is justified in putting reported miracles out of account. The closure of the physical world, causally speaking, is a foregone conclusion. That is prejudicial to traditional religious belief, but it can't be helped. That's just the way history gets done. Another person who made this popular is the German theologian and philosopher of religion, Ernst Trilch. He has an essay, which has recently been translated. I'm giving you here the English version of the title on the historical and dogmatic methods in theology. He contrasts the historical methods very much in the spirit of Kuhnen and Bradley with the classic dogmatic methods. And he argues quite explicit, explicitly, we must be guided by the principle of analogy according to which events that have no analogs in our present experience may be and must be set aside. It would be dogmatic and therefore unhistorical to countenance them. Therefore, we must reject them ab initio. Here's what Trotsch says about the principle of analogy. Biblical criticism itself 
depends on the analogy with the ways by which all the rest of antiquity has been handed down to us. In countless cases, criticism has been able to establish the states of affairs it is interested in only by the search for analogies. That means the inclusion of Judeo-Christian history and analogy with all other history, and in fact the sphere of what is excluded from analogy has grown increasingly narrow. Many have already learned how to be satisfied with the moral character of Jesus, or with his resurrection. The idea of spiritualizing Christianity and eliminating its historical content is very clearly in Trilch's mind, and of course this is exactly what Kunin also did. One more thing before we close, and this is a bit of a side trail, but a fascinating one. Several major thinkers in the free thinking movement became involved in spiritualism in the late 19th century, the contact with the dead by the means of mediums. Robert Owen, who was Alexander Campbell's sparring partner in their famous debate, turned to spiritualism late in his life. Alfred Russell Wallace, who independently conceived the idea of evolution through natural selection, became persuaded of spiritualism. And most strikingly of all, this one's really a good one, Annie Besant, who had been Charles Bradlaugh's confederate in secularism and liberal social reforms, had written a book, in fact, entitled My Path to Atheism. But very shortly after writing that book, she fell out with Bradlaugh, became dissatisfied with a secular society, and later she met and became friends with Madame Blavatsky. She was thoroughly persuaded of spiritualism, became president of the Theosophical Society in 1907, and went about promoting the work of the Theosophical Society and investigation into spiritualism from the standpoint of sincere belief in it. There's something fascinating in this, and someone at some point should do a historical study of it and trace it in the reciprocal relations of secularism and spiritualism. People seem to swing from one pole to another. I'll wind up with a couple of classic quotations which are also quoted by some of the figures in our database. One of them is from Plutarch and is quoted in John Jordan's remarks on ecclesiastical history. Plutarch says, it is a dangerous thing to be too credulous or too incredulous on some points because of the weakness of human nature, which can so difficultly preserve the true medium and sometimes runs into superstition and enthusiasm, sometimes into a neglect and contempt of things related to the deity. The best way is to proceed cautiously and to avoid extremes. And if the authority of Plutarch isn't enough for you, here's a quotation from Francis Bacon in Silva Silvarum. We have set it down as a law to ourselves to examine things to the bottom and not to receive upon credit or reject upon improbabilities until there hath passed a due examination. <laughs>